Hi everyone, Mike here. Five bucks a month? It's no surprise to anyone I love Starlink. 300 megabits per second down, 30 milliseconds latency, working on 20 milliseconds. What's not to love? But what if you don't need 300 megabits per second? And you don't want to pay 99 US per month? Would $5 a month sound better? I'm here today to tell you that it's possible and might be coming sooner than you think. But to understand how, let me tell you a story about an impossible thing that could never happen. On January 12th, 2018, a polar satellite launch vehicle, a rocket, blasted off from the eastern coast of India. Its primary payload was Cardosat 2F, an Earth observation satellite by the Indian Space Research Organization. Riding along on the launch were 30 more rideshare satellites from various companies, including four tiny microbees from a company called Swarm Technologies. So what's a microbee? In the world of really small satellites, the dominant shape is called a CubeSat, with the smallest size being a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube that people refer to as 1U. Not to be confused with this 1U or with this 1U. As satellites get bigger, they just put those cubes together. So 2U is 10 by 10 by 20, double the size, and 3U is 10 by 10 by 30, three times the size. Then there are even bigger variants from there where they just put them all together. But these microbees went the other way, taking the 1U smallest size and slicing it into four pieces. So kind of one quarter U, 10 by 10 by two and a half. Here's a picture of a microbee to give you an idea of the scale. Now I think these were actually slightly bigger around 2.8 centimeters, but still for a satellite, these are crazy small. And it's that tiny size that was the root of the impossible thing that could never happen. And who is Swarm Technologies? Well, these microbee satellites act as data store and forward devices. So a satellite is above you, you can send up some data, then as the satellite orbits, it'll send your data back down to the first ground station it passes. And this basic function is the backbone of the value that Swarm Technologies offers to its customers. Because if you think about it, there are a ton of use cases for data where you don't need ultra high bandwidth or ultra low latency. These are things like weather stations on remote mountaintops, sensor buoys in the middle of the ocean, shipping containers in transit reporting their location, that kind of thing. These are also usually the places where power is at a premium, where you might not have 100 watts to run Starlink's Dishy. So these microbees launched in 2018, and that actually is the root of the problem. They launched on a rocket, and by doing so, made history as the first ever unauthorized launch of commercial satellites. Because they launched without a license from the FCC. But that brings up a question, how are satellites authorized? An Indian rocket, American satellite, it actually goes all the way back to 1966 with the UN Outer Space Treaty, which lays out rules for how nation states operate in space. Space law. The treaty at a high level says every country has to manage their own activities, whether that's the government or any commercial entities within the country. In the US, there are a few agencies involved, but the FCC is the one that grants licenses for the radio spectrum used to communicate with satellites, which is pretty much needed by every satellite. With the space bees, the FCC was concerned that their tiny size would make them difficult to track, which would make it difficult to monitor their orbits for possible collisions. Due to this risk, the FCC denied their authorization. Now, for my research, it's not unheard of for a satellite to receive authorization just before launch, so it's likely that Swarm was hoping to get the authorization in time. But once you're integrated with the rocket and it's ready to launch, it seems like it would be pretty challenging to stop everything so you could remove four tiny satellites that are a secondary payload. So, up they went. Plus 
you can actually see the satellites deploying. There's the primary payload, the Cartasat 2F. It's hard to tell exactly, but I think the space bees are going right there. And then the rest of the rideshare satellites launching after that. So the FCC was a bit miffed and launched an investigation, suspending all further launches by Swarm until they concluded. In the end, Swarm CEO Sarah Spangello described the unauthorized launch as a mistake. The FCC decided to fine Swarm $900,000, but then allowed them to proceed with further launches with some additional oversight and paperwork for every launch. In my view, the FCC should have given authorization to the original launch. Their concern about tracking was unfounded. The satellites were picked up as soon as they were deployed. But Swarm really shouldn't have launched without a license. Let me know what you think down in the comments. So putting it behind them, Swarm kept building, kept growing, and now they have over 100 satellites in space providing communications with small messages, around 200 bytes per message, for only $5 per month per device. Now, I hear you, Mike, what does this have to do with $5 Starlink? Well, SpaceX has just acquired Swarm Technologies. Now, there's not a ton of details out there, except for this FCC filing where Swarm Technologies and SpaceX are jointly asking the FCC to approve transfer of all of Swarm's licenses for their satellites, ground stations, and user terminals in their VHF band over to SpaceX as part of this acquisition. And now to the real question, what does this mean for Starlink? First, I love talking about this stuff. If you do too, subscribe down below and hit the bell to get notified of new updates as soon as they come out. Use the like button to let me know what you think of this video. So Swarm and Starlink have very different customers in mind. Starlink provides high bandwidth, low latency internet <clears throat> connections to their customers. Swarm targets more device level communication with Internet of Things, really small low powered devices sending much smaller message oriented communication, measured in hundreds of bytes per message. Up in space, Swarm has these great tiny satellites, but there's no reason that the Swarm satellites have to be small. That's mainly to save money on launch costs. SpaceX could just add VHF transceivers to all their Starlink satellites. Heck, maybe they already have VHF hardware on board. And now, all of a sudden, Swarm's low-power terminals can tap directly into Starlink's low-latency backbone to enable even more use cases. And what I really love is this potentially leads to many different form factors for Starlink. We've got Starlink's dishy that we all know and love, with hundreds of megabits per second, drawing 100 watts, and now we've got Swarm on the other extreme with smaller messages, drawing tiny amounts of power in a tiny package, both extremes for satellite communication. This really opens up the potential for devices in between those extremes. Maybe you wanna stream live video from some drones or something. It would be great to have a smaller phased array with slower speed, but lower power, with just enough bandwidth for the live video and maybe some control signals. Or maybe an even smaller unit with enough bandwidth for phone calls or something. A ton of possibilities there. Now Swarm appears to still be operating as Swarm. They've just launched an eval kit for their service, and I've actually got one. I'm going to be going into a ton more detail on it, a deep dive on the kit and the overall service in a later video. I'm super excited to start playing with it. And I really have high expectations from Swarm to continue to see enhancements to their low power service going forward. It's an exciting time for space and I'm thrilled to share it with all of you. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.